It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Jennifer Brozek. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Hello. I'm doing just fine. It's a beautiful day. Where are in you? The Se- oh, we're in the Seattle area. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, well, it's almost summer, you know? It's been a very wet May, but the sun is shining high right now for me. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at your bio. There is like, uh, did you write all these books? God, there must be. 70 of them on here. <laughs> no, I, I am a full-time uh, author, editor, and media tie-in writer, and I've been doing it for almost 15 years now. Okay. Explain what a media tie-in writer is. So a media tie-in writer is someone who writes stories in another person's universe. For example, I have written short stories in the V Wars universe for Jonathan Mayberry. I've also written... A predator story, Masters of Orion. I have done a number of Valdemar stories for Mercedes Lackey's series. Uh, and I also do a lot of Battletech and Shadowrun for the gamers out there. Okay. How is that different than a ghostwriter? Uh, a ghostwriter doesn't get credit. Though oh. there is there there is a trick. If you ever read a book by a well-known celebrity, if you look on the credits page and you see special thanks to, that's often the actual name of the ghostwriter. But as a tie-in writer, my name carries weight as someone who writes in the universe and it is canon. All right. I've always been a little bit, and let's just talk about this for a second maybe and get your input on this. I've always been a little bit, I don't know, confused. I'll use that word about ghostwriting because in one sense they're not getting credit like you said mm-hmm. but they're actually writing the story and somebody else is putting their name on it as the assumed writer and I always thought that that was like kind of on the borderlines of plagiarism because you're oh, not Oh no 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 <laughs> uh, it it's it's a very different uh animal for publishing. What often happens with a ghostwriter is they spend a lot of time having a conversation with the the celebrity uh, and working with them on what they want for the book. Writing, everybody can write, but not everybody can write well. A ghostwriter has the talent to write and gets paid well to write uh, the story that the celebrity wants to tell. Uh, oftentimes a ghostwriter will be paid just to uh, put together a pitch for the the person in question. Okay, but it's um, but you can't hire somebody to write your college thesis for you. No, that that is definitely not ghostwriting. That is ghostwriting is a profession. <laughs> um, writing someone else's thesis is basically cheating. <laughs> right. It's just completely different animals. Okay, I, I'm just I'm in my no, mind. No. It sounds like the same thing, though. But no, a I, thesis is, is expected to be written by the person and then defended by the person. A ghostwriter interviews the the celebrity. They they have conversations. They often record um, what is said, and then they can put the story as it was told to them into prose. Okay. All right. But they don't get credit on the book necessarily. No. And often that comes with the price tag. So in lieu of credit, you get paid basically. Yes. Right? And and often, I mean, there are times that people don't want the credit. They just enjoy writing, but they don't want any aspect of fame. Oh, well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So it would be different. Like I know that there are some people that just use a different name. Because they don't want the fame for their real name, so they use a pen name, right? But they still write That's the story. That's very easy to find out. Yeah. Unless you're like, I know Stephen King tried that, mm-hmm. but his style was so unique that everybody knew it was him. 
I forget the name he used, but he tried well, writing. Well, he started out with Richard Bachman. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah. And he then later, once he became famous, took those Richard Bachman books and the, had them republished after I'm sure editing again, because we all get better as we write. Writing is one of those talents that gets better as you use it. I always thought there was two components because I'm a, a singer songwriter. Mm -hmm. And I always thought like music, there's two components to writing. There's the music side and then there's the lyric side. But there mm -hmm. is the talent to be able to create something from nothing, the story basically. And then the writing aspect of it is a craft where, like you said, you get better as you go on, mm -hmm. where you learn how to format things properly and use words or don't use words, depending. And that's the part that practice makes perfect, I think. It's true. Stories are a dime a dozen. I can make up a story out of pretty much anything. I actually challenged uh, 300 sixth graders once time. You know, give me any specific object and I'll turn it into a horror story. And I did uh, because it's easy to turn anything into a story. It's the execution that's difficult. It's the execution that takes practice. It right? does. And yeah. you learn, you level up as you learn how to put words together, how to put paragraphs, how do paragraphs make scenes, how do scenes make chapters how do chapters make acts within a book and then how many how the acts come together to create an entire whole story what do you think is the uh, one of the biggest sort of newbie mistakes that authors and and uh, aspiring authors that they make oftentimes i think they don't trust the reader to keep up they they add too many mundane details like uh, often you can change from one scene to another, which could be from going from the house to the school or to work without having to explain how someone left their house, uh, got on the tram, got into the elevator and got to their desk. Unless you're writing a very specific type of science fiction story where everything is important and every description of the, the technology and the movement is part of the world building. Can you hear my cat snoring? <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Do you want me to wake him up? Oh, I hate Could for I... you to have to wake him up. But uh, I, I wasn't sure what that was. You know what it sounded like? It sounded like a phone ringing that was on vibrate. <laughs> no, it's uh, my cat, Pharaoh, is 14 and a half years old. He is old and senile a senior like his sister. cat yes definitely yeah i have two cat. i actually have four cats one husband and about 1500 books <laughs> obviously your priorities are with books yeah oh oh yes well mm. my entire career is well it's actually thanks to my husband because he supports my publishing habit oh well that's great so you can write full-time and he goes and works at a job you know yes and uh, he he doesn't like it when I don't write because I get grumpy. I, I've seen that with other people, not necessarily writers, but with uh, mm -hmm. creative people generally. They're fine when they're working. You know, they're brilliant when they're working. When they're not working, they can be sometimes a miserable mess. It, it's true. And yeah. right now yeah. I'm not writing, I'm editing. And that's a different type of crea uh, creation. We, uh, Kat Rambo and I put together the reinvented heart, which just came out. And right now we're putting together the reinvented detective and you're, as an editor, you're creating, um, more than uh, something that's more than the sum of its parts. Um, Kat Rambo was actually on the show on the video show, I don't know, a year ago, at least. I remember we had a conversation about writing in other people's universe or like there would be three or four authors that wrote one mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that to be interesting as well because how do you write so that your style still shows but yet it still fits into the book so it doesn't look like four people wrote the book? Well, I know that uh, I've, I've done several collaborations. One was with Shauna McGuire and 
we actually solved that issue by writing two points of view and we threw the, the points of view back and forth. And then once the story was done, she took an edit pass on it and then I took an edit pass on it. And it was one of those things where we both have different points of view, but the editing, the, the way we edited made it sound like one voice. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. A lot of story is written, is created in the editing process. Writing gets it out of your head. Editing turns it into a story that can be put into someone else's head. Well, yeah, like film. Mm -hmm. I mean, film, you've got miles and miles of, uh, <laughs> or megabytes, gigabytes. And, uh, but when you put, edit it, it can, well, you could come up with four different stories. Yeah, depending on Absolutely. how it's cut. Yeah. Well, it's rather like those people who take um, trailer, movie trailers and uh, recut them to different music and turn Mary Poppins from a lighthearted uh, children's movie to a thriller. Yeah, yeah. It's all in the presentation, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of acronyms on your bio here, and I have no idea what they are. Maybe you can just tell us. Let's see. S. F W A. That is the science fiction, science fiction and fantasy writers of America. It is a 501c3 writing organization uh, that is here to help writers uh, write, help them deal with um, medical issues. Sometimes deal with uh, if a publisher is not going to to pub, uh, pay them. They have a grievance committee. They are a community, and uh, it's it's just one of those marks of becoming a professional writer that you qualify for CIFLA. Oh, I see. So if you write a book and you would submit it to them, and they would give you kind of a gold seal of approval oh, or something, or no, you have to you have to make a sale. Or if you're in this in incredibly exciting day of publishing. Uh, you can self-publish, and you have to make a certain amount of money to qualify to be oh, part okay. of the Oh, I see. Or, you know, as a game writer or as a screenwriter. Okay. Then we've got HWA and IAMTW. Okay. So HWA is the Horror Writers Association, and that is focused on those people who write um, dark speculative fiction. And they also have a community, uh, a, a grievance committee. Um, they work, actually all of the, um, the different uh, writing groups got together and, and worked on get, helping independent writers get medical insurance. Uh, so there's, it, a lot of times it also, there are calls for submission for people who have become professional writers uh, again, the Horror Writers Association is another stellar organization that uh, you have to qualify to become a member of. Okay. And the last one is the, okay, let me see if I can get this right. The International Associate, oh, let me, I have to look this one the, up. I never get it right. I, I remember it as <laughs> I am a tie-in writer. There's a labor union that has almost the same acronym, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. You're it only... is the International yeah. Association of Media Tie-In Writers. Okay. And right. that is for those of us who, say, um, write Bond movie, uh, Bond books or Jessica Fletcher books or any uh, tie-in for uh, – role-playing games or video games, you know, like all those, the Halo books and such. So uh, support groups, essentially, right? Well, they are support groups, but they're professional groups because, like, tie-in writing is a very different uh, form of animal. You don't own what you write. You are writing in someone else's property, and you are doing something which is often called work for hire. So okay. while you get credit for it, you don't own it, so you can't take it and, say, reprint it, resell it if it goes out of print. A good example is I wrote a novella for Arkham Horror on one of their characters, and it was 25,000 words, and I wanted to put together a Lovecraft-based short story collection and include that. 
I cannot, I am not allowed without licensing it back from Fantasy Flight Games. Mm, interesting. Okay. So it is similar to music. Um, mm -hmm. I did a couple of songs that were produced by a very famous producer in London, and he put musicians for hire on the track, and we did this sort of remotely, like I did my bit and sent it to him, and then he added all the stuff and then sent it back. It's my song. I own it. I can do whatever I want with it, but I cannot recut it mm -hmm. without his permission. Mm -hmm. That is that is very true. Yeah. I can some of the stories that I have written. I have a permission. I have permission written into the contract that I can include it into a what's called a single single author collection which basically means it's a, a collection of short stories that I have written, but I can't say put it into an anthology, which is a collection of short stories written by a bunch of different authors. Right, okay. We touched on publishing for a second. I just want to go back to that, and then we'll get to your book here. The Reinvented Heart, is that your latest one? Yeah, that is the newest, the first in the series of the reinvented anthologies. Okay, and I see Cat Rambo's name on here as well. Okay, uh, before we get to the book, though, let's talk just a little bit about publishing because there is self-publishing, there's hybrid publishing, and then there's traditional publishing. Which one are you, I guess, to start out with? I do it all. You do it all. I have self -pub I have been published by small press. I've been published by traditional press. Okay. Is there any one that you prefer over the other, or is it purely a matter of taste for the individual author? It, it, is, it is a matter of how much control do you want over the project. If you self-pub, you are in control of everything, but that means you are also responsible for everything. You're responsible for hiring, hiring an editor, and everybody needs an editor. You are responsible for, for finding uh, a good cover or a good cover artist, and you are responsible for paying them, and you're responsible for putting the book into um, the correct format, and then you are responsible for putting it, if you want it sold in bookstores, uploading it to Lightning Source and paying that fee, and you're also required to put it onto Amazon or any myriad number of small jobs that are done you have control over, but you also have responsibility for. With small press, they take care of a lot of the business side, but you are still responsible to make sure you help with the, the PR and uh, you, they don't have as wide of a market. They don't often, small press often doesn't get into bookstores, brick and mortar stores, as I should say. And then traditional press is, again, you are also still required to do the PR, yeah. but they, yeah. they have way more control over everything. Like when Da did my book, A Human for a Day, I never saw the cover uh, until it hit Amazon. Same with Bay and Books and Shattered Shields. I never saw the cover. I was never asked. But my my Bram Stoker nominated series, the Melissa Allen series, Never Let Me Sleep, Never Let Me Leave, Never Let Me Die, I got to say what kind of model I wanted. And then they would mock up the the picture, the, the covers, and then I could tell them whether it was good or not. And then with it, when it comes to self pop, I, I got to design the covers myself and hire the, the artists. So it's how much control do you want? And thus, how much responsibility do you want? Right. Also, the, the percentage that you get from book sales is a lot higher if you do it yourself, isn't it? It's true. Yeah. However, you also have to outlay the cash to, to pay hire all, everybody right. and put it into Lightning Source and uh, pay for editors, authors, uh, artists, um, someone who does cover copy and such like that. And then, of course, all the PR, anything that you, if you want to buy ads and such. You have to outlay a lot more money up front. And hopefully you get it back. Hopefully. <laughs> Oftentimes you do. If you if you build up an audience, you will get it back. I, I have heard the phrase that you need a thousand dedicated fans to make your career. A thousand dedicated fans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't seem like a lot. 
it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it also seems like forever. I mean, most people don't sell more than 500 copies of their book. Yeah. Same with music. You know, I think I think the internet, while on one sense, has democratized the playing field for everybody. Everybody's there, and so you're competing with 100,000 uh, times more people than there were. And selling 500 books seems like absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, back when people would sell millions and millions. And that's where traditional publishing versus sometimes um, the smaller presses or self-publishing sometimes can help far and above because they have the PR, they know who, they know how the business works. Uh, one of the other, you asked about newbie mistakes, is not understanding that publishing is a business. Sure. And yeah. if you want to, if you just want to get your work out there, you might as well just put it on a website. If you want to make a career and make money, you should probably go into nonfiction, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> But if you have a passion for creating fictional worlds, then you have to base your career on how you can support yourself or your loving spouse supports you or your family supports you uh, because fiction doesn't pay that much money. And people don't understand that if you get a very large advance, that advance has to last you for years, sometimes literally. Yeah, until it's get until it's paid back, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's exactly the same game in the music industry. It's mm -hmm. exactly the same thing. Okay, let's uh, let's touch on your book, uh, the reinvented heart, and this was a collaboration between you and Cat Rambo. Yes, we both edited it. It was her uh, initial idea, and I. This was my twenty first anthology. So I've had a lot of experience creating anthologies, and she contacted me and asked for asked me one if I wanted to take over, and I said no because I've always wanted to creatively work with Cat. I met Cat Rambo when she was the president of CIFLA, and I was on the board of directors. Oh, okay. So I've, I had worked with her before, but in a very business sense. Okay. Oh, I see. And then there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and more. So this is a lot of people who wrote this. Yes, we have uh, approximately, let's see, it looks like 21, uh, sorry, 22. We have three poems by Jane Yolen, but we have uh, 21 fiction authors. 21 authors for mm -hmm. one book, okay. So each author contributed a very, I'm thinking, just a small amount. Yeah. Well, one story, um, one off, story. it was between uh, two, well, it was supposed to be between uh, three and five thousand words. Uh, we did have one one uh, author, Justina Robson, who was asked to to contribute a story. She wrote a story that was originally something like eight thousand words, and Cat sent it back and said, "You know, you have to you have to modify this." And when she was done, it was, I think, eleven thousand words. Oh, it got bigger. And <laughs> I was so mad. We both, she's like, well, I asked for the story. Let's read it. And then she read, read it and she's like, you have to read this. And I'm like, I will read it, but it doesn't fit our guidelines. And that make you know, that's not something I want to pursue. And then the story was so good. Oh my gosh. was it's It's amazing. It's such a good story. It's called... Our savage heart calls to itself across the endless tides. Well, that's a nice title. And it's about a self-aware sh ship with a cyborg uh, captain and the shenanigans they get up to rescuing people. So, okay, let me ask you something about how this is set up. So is it the same characters that everybody is writing about? No, no. no. We, we broke it out into three different sections, hearts, hands, and minds. The Reinvented Heart is a science fiction and fantasy anthology set in uh, the future of, of relationships. What, how will relationships change as technology grows, as our worlds you know, grow across galaxies? And it's not just 
romantic relationships. It's family relationships. It's uh, relationships with your pets, relationships with self-aware AIs, relationships with your peers. And of course, there are some romances. Um, and it, it this anthology takes a, a look at different relationships of people and how they will interact as things get much more complex and much larger. Felicia Drake wrote a, a story called Ships of Theseus. Are you are you familiar with the Ship of Theseus? No. So there's a the Ship of Theseus was is an old ship, Greek ship, that has been preserved, uh, and as it is made of wood. As things rot, it is that the the piece is replaced, and there is the philosophical question that when the last piece it, that has rotted has been replaced with something that better, um, newer, is it still the same ship that it was? Is that your cat again? It is. I, I keep waking him <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, that's good. Now I want to leave this in there. I, I think this is a new one for the show. I don't think. I've done probably 700 shows, and I don't think I've ever had a snoring cat. So. Well, he's, I woke him up, and now he's meowing at me. Oh, I he's, heard that. Yeah, he, he's not happy you woke him up. Um, so, okay, but, so go, getting back to your book. So essentially the stories are all independent, but the common mm -hmm. thread is relationships? That is correct. Okay. All right. And is the book out? It is out in ebook. book uh, it actually comes out in a physical copy on Tuesday, the 31st, because the the whole pandemic, we had a supply chain issues. So since we had a bunch of pre-orders, it was originally supposed to come out March 9th. And our publisher, Arc Manor, decided to go ahead and let the ebook come out when it was scheduled to. And then now we're having the big push uh for the physical copy that's coming out. Okay, great. It'll be very nice to hold this book in our hands. <laughs> and actually, one uh, yeah. of our authors, uh, Rosemary Claire Smith, is at Balticon right now, and she found a copy in the wild. Oh. So it, it, it's available now. Okay, great. Well, Jennifer, we do have to wind this down. We are out of time. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Do you uh, want to give out your website? Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, it's jenniferbrozek.com. And if you like science fiction, fantasy, and anything with often a high body count, I have Shadowrun and Battletech. Yeah. Your <laughs> cat's dying to get on the show. I know. He yeah. is. He yeah. absolutely is. He has turned up in a couple of podcasts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, otherwise, I'm on Twitter uh, as Jennifer Brozek. And if you would like to see pictures of my cat, Instagram, Jennifer underscore Brozek. I think I'm going to see check all four out. of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jennifer, thank you again for coming on the show. It was nice talking to you. And best thank of you. luck with everything you're doing. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm.